presentation structure for that. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome, one and all, uh, in the month of March. This month's grand rounds is dedicated to uh, tuberculosis department, chess department, in view of World TB Day, and also something very new and to share by the general medicine department on on adult vaccination. So we'll be starting with the chess medicine department on tuberculosis. And the first speaker is uh, Dr. Alpa Dalal. She's the head of the department and she needs no introduction in Thane or anywhere else in the country. She's done a lot of work on tuberculosis. She still pursues her passion and goes to Shivri every week uh, to see patients who are not affording and who are on a second line, third line drugs. So I'll invite Dr. Alpa Dalal to start the talk. Good afternoon, uh, all of you attending offline and online. Today's session is dedicated to tuberculosis. Okay. We just celebrated World TB Day on 24th of March. And the best way to celebrate any day is update your knowledge and acquire skills and knowledge and apply it in your real life scenario. Because the biggest challenge is applying your skills and knowledge in real life scenario. So today's, uh, I'll start off with my topic. What is the role of private sector in management of TB and what role does it play in NTB 2025 game? Because many of the private sector, they feel that because they don't have access to the newer drugs and now TB treatment has been majorly taken over by the government programs. Do they really have any role to play or they are just uh, uh, mute spectator? So in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to take you through this uh, presentation. So what is the NTB actually? So many people of many times, people uh, feel very, uh, you know, skeptical about ending TB in India by 2025. So actually it is not about elimination of TB completely, but it is about achieving a sustainable development goals. And what means, what does it mean that the NTB strategy is about reducing the number of patients suffering from TB by 90%, reducing the TB death by 90%. And important thing is protecting the families from negative impact of TB. So we have taken a pledge of ending or achieving this sustainable development goals 10 years ahead of the global uh, target. Uh, let's talk about the positive things first. Uh, overall, when you talk of TB scenario, it seems very depressing and at times distressing, but there have been achievements. So from 2000 to 2015, 49 million lives saved because of the TB programs and there are 22% drop in the TB death. What about India? So achievements of India in MDR and XDR TB outcomes, uh, compared to 2012, uh, MDR TB successful outcome increased from 46% to 66%, a huge increase of 20%. And in XDR TB, it is almost doubled from 32% to 62%. And this was largely because of the newer drugs, which got uh, which got available almost after four decades. A new drug, Bedaquilin, became available. And now we have Bedaquilin, Delaminate, and even Pretominate available in government programs. So after introduction of this new drug in 2019, there has been huge improvement in the success rate of MDR and XDR TB. Now, what is the role of the private sector in this NTB plan? So the government survey, National TB Prevalence Survey 2015 to 2021, it was found that 50% of the patient with TB symptom, they seek care in the private sector. So whatever achievements and challenges are there, or whatever problems are there, private sector has 50% participation into this. So whether you are treating the patient in public sector or private sector, you need a lot of passion, you need skills and knowledge, and you need to act. So a combination of heart, head, and hand are required for making a mark in ending TB <clears throat> epidemic. So this was the Global Tuberculosis Report 2022. You can see here the incidence of TB cases globally, 10.6 million out of that. 28% cases are from India. Mortality of TB, 35% of total global deaths are from India. And you can see your incidence of MDR-TB. Almost one-fourth of MDR-TB globally are from India. 
and 32 percent of the children are from india so india we are leading cause of not only incidence of tb but also mortality and in mdr tb okay now where are we in meeting up the milestone the target set so it was uh, said that between 2015 to 25 there should be there would be 50 percent reduction in the tb incidence but the actual scenario is between 2050 to 21 there's only 10 percent reduction so we are 90 percent uh, I mean, 40 percent short of the target reduction in number of TB deaths. We've been able to achieve only 5.9 percent reduction in the death. And by 25, the milestone milestone set is that reduction in TB to uh, zero death. But currently, it is just 48 percent reduction in TB death. So we have a long way to go. So let's discuss how how this. Uh, role of private sector in this uh, entire NTB plan. This was a 17-year-old male referred from Nagpur because our TB uh, unit at TB hospital, it is a referral center for all over Maharashtra. We had this patient referred from Nagpur in March 2023. He was diagnosed with EPTB, left-sided pleural effusion in August 22. He was treated with first-line AKT. And you can see here, patient was first seen in the private sector by a general uh, physician who also had uh, a diploma in tuberculous diseases. So pleural effusion, you can see on this X-ray clearly, it is moderate pleural effusion, but somehow on the paper was mentioned that it is mild pleural effusion. The diagram which is drawn also doesn't match the X-ray picture. And it was decided not to tap this patient and patient was started on anti tb treatment. So you can see here the prescription accurate for which has a combination of all four drugs and it has been given in divided dose. Okay. Along with that, it was decided to start the patient on steroids. Subsequently, patient was not really doing well. As you can see, the dosage of AKD, which is given in divided dose. So because the patient was not doing well, uh, levofloxacin was added and that too was given in divided dose. Now, patient was not improving clinically, radiologically, and you can see here the X-ray from August after three months of AKD. Hello? Uh, so can you hear it now? Audio is clear? Okay. Uh, so she is getting the feedback. Yeah, I'm sorry about. So uh, you can see here the clinical radiological. You want me to repeat the case? No, no. no. So you can see your clinical radiological non-response from August 22, November 22. There is no response. So patient underwent decortication here. Plural tissue and fluid was sent, but gene expert and AB culture were negative. Now patient was treated by a chest physician. Again, you can see here uh, rifampicin 600, isoniazide 300, ethambutol 600, and pyrazinamide 1000 milligram. Weight was 46 kg. Again, this patient has received uh, underdose for his weight. Now uh, in Jan 23, patient developed headache and convulsion and uh, CT brain was done which showed thick ring en enhancing lesions in the right temporal and frontal white matter. You can see here thick ring enhancing lesion. This clearly showed that patient is not responding uh, clinically. So the CT scan was repeated just to find out if there is any uh, new lesions in the lung. But you can see this October uh, CT scan, this was just before the decortication and the CT scan now. And there has not been much uh, change in the CT scan and there has not been new lesion developed. Okay. Now patient was here started on second line AKT. Here the weight is 56 kg. It was started on amikacin 500, levofloxacin 1000 milligram, linezolid 600 milligram, flofa 100 milligram and ethionamide. So he has been put on 
second line akt because patient is not responding there has been clinical worsening radiological worsening and now one new system has got involved is got tns involved so fair enough this patient needs to be started on on clinical basis the patient needs to be started on second line akt so at this point patient was referred to gtb hospital our nodal tb center uh, he has already completed 7 weeks of, weeks of akt he has poor appetite weight gain is there 5 kg because he was also on steroids along with the uh, second line akt for cns tb now he has mild headache cns symptoms are resolved no fear uh, no fever and spo to 99% and pulse he has tachycardia and ct scan you can see here there has been some increase in the lesion so what do we do at this stage now so would you continue the same regimen so how many of you would say that you would continue the same regimen because now patient has already been put on second line akt patient is uh, clinically symptom wise not much better there has been a little weight gain how many of you would say this stop second line regimen as there is no microbiological proof or uh, drtb is not been proven and restart the first line akt change to newer regimen or do any further assessment now how would this patient be treated in the private sector and how would this patient be treated in public sector so there are some uh, you know strengths and weaknesses of having been treated uh, treating the patient in private sector and public sector then so public sector probably because they don't have a uh, evidence that patient has resistant tb because they would be very very reluctant to start this patient on second line akt but in private sector i would say this is the right approach to take because patient is not clinically improving but when we are talking of private sector managing the patient it is not only just one person but number of patients who are involved in management of uh, this case and this is not to just criticize the you know the prescription or the treatment part but looking at this uh, you know scenario and trying to understand our lesson that what we should not be doing so first of all the patient was not investigated in the beginning no invasive test was done the diagnosis was not established the resistance whether it is there or not it was not established patient was started on anti tb treatment which was not according to the weight band and the dosages were divided it was given tid doses along with that without ruling out regression tb uh, steroids were given now all this all this would have possibly contributed to patient developing regression tuberculosis then when the patient was uh, treated by uh, another chest physician that time again the dosages were not corrected the same medicine continued of course they had sent the tissue for diagnosis culture and everything and it did not grow and then later on patient was started on second line akt here again the dosages could have been better because patient was weighing around 50 kg stomic acid days could have been or at this point patient could have been referred to the public sector so when you discuss in the public sector tell them that on clinical basis you have uh, started this patient on second line and they would uh, help you to get access to the newer medication so already he was exposed to a lot of drug now at this point patient has come to public sector and now we have been given the challenge how to treat this patient so already levofloxacin clopal linezolid ethionamide has been used and now very few options are left with us to formulate a new regimen and that is that is why it is very important that we are very judicious about starting our anti tb treatment and make sure make all the attempts to get the diagnosis okay. so now we have to start the patient on the drug which are left but before that neurological assessment is very important now this is something which we don't get in public sector so i when i practice in my tb hospital opd i don't have access to a neurologist who give me an opinion so i called the patient here a neurological assessment was done and was said that it doesn't necessarily look like patient has not responded only some vasculitis area increase so another plan was that whether do whole body pet ct scan to find out whether the activity is there or no then do complete pre treatment evaluation already patient is taking some treatment so whether there are some side effects you need to assess with audiometry and cv studies and then design a new regimen which should have at least three new drugs added to the existing regimen 
so this is this is what is the scenario actually and this is a very good paper which was published in hypothesis journal by dr lancelot pinto and what actually happens when a patient gets treated of tuberculosis a patient presenting with symptoms of tb a huge number very few percentage of this patient will actually get investigated for tb now of this investigation maybe few patient will actually get the relevant investigation done and the appropriate test being conducted out of that few patient will actually end up completing the test and then they will get diagnosed appropriately after that even less a number of patient would get correct treatment and then they complete and cure and that is why almost 70 to 80% of the patient who present with tb symptoms are lost and not getting the appropriate treatment done and this is where we have a big role to play as a private sector how we can improvise and change this so this is again the saying that we are talking of controlling tb and ending tb but even today in fact last month itself we had four patient presented to us in tb presented to icu all four of them in critical state and this was something which was really disturb all of us that in today's era in city of mumbai we are getting this patients complex and extensive tb and so this was a 59 year old lady so schizophrenic she was diagnosed to have drug sensitive tb et secretion showed ab plus and this was uh, drug sensitive so refa sensitive disseminated disease she died within few days and you can see your extensive lung involvement case 2 he was 20 what 1 year old female drug resistant she had disseminated tb she presented with extensive disease and a pneumothorax and tb myocarditis she is currently now discharged and on treatment third case was a young boy 15 years old uh, he was uh, not immunodeficient but uh, immunodeficient is a primary immunodeficiency syndrome male had drug sensitive tb disseminated disease cns mediary choroidal and uh, spine tb also so he is under treatment now he is uh, still in the hospital he is paraplegic and fourth case was 39 year old lady with uncontrolled diabetes schizophrenia she is female patient again she had drug sensitive tb she presented with pneumothorax a uh, so very bad uh, bronchopulmonary fistula we could not save this patient so out of this four patient two patient died now we just tried to go back into the history and just find out that what was the delay from onset of symptom to initiation of the treatment so in first case that uh, schizophrenia lady you can see 90 days from onset of symptoms to treatment initiation so initial delay was patient seeking help so first 45 days patient self didn't realize and didn't don't seek help in second case after almost 2 months patient seek help and after having seek help 4 months more were lost for being diagnosed with tb in third case 210 days patient was having from the initiation of symptoms to starting the treatment out of that after being coming to the healthcare system 6 more months were taken to diagnose the patient similarly even in the last case you can say that uh, last case patient seek help less she was herself a doctor she was self treating herself and she seek help only when she was extremely bad and became hypoxic so this is how the delay has been happening either because patients are not aware or after coming into medical system also appropriate investigations are not asked for so coming back to what is the role of the private sector and we must understand exactly what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses this is not to criticize anybody or not to uh, you know not to blame anybody but as a complete sector we have to start seeing that where where we have uh, have strength so easy accessibility of care is what is the strength of the private sector we have infrastructures and resources available if the patient is affording single point contact so if i am the treating doctor every time patient comes the patient meets me and this doesn't happen in the public sector every time we'll meet a different medical officer so that bonding doesn't happen skills and expertise we have all the multi specialty teams available and that is what is very much uh, very much necessary for comprehensive tb care which is not available in the public sector but the biggest challenge that we have is 
unregularized and uncontrolled private sector. So private sector is just not two people. The entire spectrum of MBBS, non-MBBS doctors, specialists, non-specialists, everybody treating, and there is no regularization on that. Lack of accountability. Now, sometimes when I see this sad prescription, I feel like that can we not have some accountability or some legality as to how we should be writing our prescription, but that is not happening. Lack of knowledge and skills. No motivation or time to update. So that is, again, if you are very busy in your practice, you have no time or motivation. Not practicing standard of care. Not referring the patient to public sector. Now, this is, again, a big challenge because many of the doctors, they don't like the fact that the newer drugs are not available in the private sector. But when you look at complete dis disparity and unregularized work in the private sector, how can this drug may be made available to private sector unless accountability increases. But you can refer your patient to the public sector, have the access to the drugs, and you can continue to monitor and follow up your patient. So funding for poor patient is uh, a challenge in the private sector. So these are all challenges. How are challenges of public sector also? What are the strengths? So they have access to the newer drugs. They have the accountability, a reporting system, the training and practice-based guideline happens. So the moment the new guideline gets rolled out, everybody compulsorily has to undergo the guideline training and they have to practice according to guideline. The funding is available. They have mechanism to track the defaulter, data collection, evidence, reporting, all that happens. But there are other challenges. They don't have good infrastructure, train human resource, lack of facilities, poor accessibility, implementation of guideline happens. Sometimes there's so much of rigid protocol that they would not deviate from that protocol and use their clinical skill to diagnose and treat and a lot of bureaucracy. So these are the challenges. So whether you are managing your patient in public or private sector, you need all this infrastructure, human resource, training, and that's very important. I think even private sector, we must have training for the guideline as well as clinical training. The diagnostic treatment, multi-specialty team, non-pharmacological treatment, tracing the contact data and publication. So all this has to be there. So just few next few slides. As a private sector doctor, how do I manage TB patients in private practice? So training and updating the new guidelines is very important. Follow the diagnostic algorithm, whether it's pulmonary TB or uh, extra pulmonary TB. So what is the diagnostic algorithm? Just to see that. Now, this is very important for all of us. We are managing patients of pulmonary TB or extrapulmonary TB. So you must collect the sample for gene expert, AFB smear, AFB culture, and first-line LP and second-line LP if your smear is positive. So once your gene expert shows that it is RIFAS sensitive, it doesn't stop there. You ask for the first-line LPA rule out INH resistant because a large number of patients do have INH mono resistant. So then if INH is also sensitive, then this patient is pushed on first line AKT. If you find that there is INH resistance, then ask for second line LPA and liquid culture, rule out fluoroquinolone resistance, which is also very common in our country, in our city also, then to start the patient on H mono resistance regimen. If patient has rapamycin resistance, then you should upfront ask for first line LPA, second line LPA, liquid culture, and refer the person to specialist or refer the patient to the program. I would encourage all of you that once you diagnose patient to have drug resistant, please refer this patient to public sector and don't deprive them of the, the new drug which is available, which is so very effective. Okay, so treating MDR-TB is not just having writing a cocktail of medication, but there are a lot of other issues in managing these patients. You must know all the definition, drug sensitive TB, monoresistant TB, resistant to one of the drug, mainly it is uh, isoniazide. Rifampicin resistant is uh, your MDR TB, polydrug resistant is any other drug apart from isoniazide and rifampicin. MDR TB is resistant to HNR both. Uh, Pre-fluoro XDR TB is resistant to fluoroquinolone. Now, from 2021, the definition of XDRTB has changed because now we no longer use aminoglycoside. It is not encouraged. So now XDRTB is fluoroquinolone plus either bedaquiline or linezolid. 
and beyond that is extremely drug resistant TB. So when you are treating TB, you must know all this. You must know the right dosages. You can take the picture of this, uh, this and you must know the dosages in children. Usually the dosages are higher. I mean, say, this patient is 17 year old boy. He should have got a higher, higher dose of isoniazide and rifampicin. Then aggressive diagnostic approach is very important. Try all possible things to approach, I mean, to get a tissue and subject it for uh, evaluation. Drug sensitive TB should be according to guideline, drug resistant TB, refer to the public sector. It's a good thing to have public private partnership. You refer the patient to public sector and then continue to follow up your patient for clinical radiological and microbiological response and also for adverse drug reaction and develop multi-speciality team. Screening of contacts is very important. That's very much part of your TB management and periodic screening of high-risk patients for early diagnosis. See, all of us, be it from any speciality, all of us see the patients and now with increase organ transplant and patient being on immunosuppressant treatment, it is very important that we screen our high-risk patients. Uh, so you can see here, there's significant increase in the uh, possibility of your patient having TB if they have HIV or if they are on dialysis or steroid treatment, there are multiple rise in the possibility of uh, having TB. So all your patients with multiple comorbidities, you must screen at least once in a year or if they have symptoms, then you should screen them uh, appropriately for ruling out TB. Then uh, communication with your colleagues. So sometimes you may see such irrational uh, prescription and very often we shy away from pointing this out to our colleagues, you know, because we feel that, but I think a very uh, assertive communication or good feedback has to be given it is not about blaming or criticizing anybody, but how responsible do we feel for creating the drug resistance in the community and having uh, spreading this disease? So I think communication, making them attend CMEs, it's very important. Uh, patient education and awareness, end of treatment counseling, and you should follow up your patient every three to six months for next two years to, uh, to detect any relapse and having a public-private partnership, I think is the best way to go forward. So before writing the prescription of AKT, ask yourself, have I confirmed the diagnosis? Have I made any reasonable attempt to obtain sample? Have I written the rational prescription as per the latest guideline? Am I aware of the latest guideline? Have I ruled out drug resistance? Have I counseled my patient enough? And have I addressed the comorbidity? So treating, TB, either DSTB or DRT, yeah. is not just about writing a cocktail of drugs, but having a complete comprehensive plan. So just 10 common pitfalls, not suspecting TB, versus the standard of TB care of India says that early diagnosis, as soon as your patient has symptoms for three weeks of fever, weight loss, anorexia, or cough, you must investigate for TB. Inadequate workup while you have to follow up diagnostic algorithm. Third pitfall is inappropriate test. Microbiological tests are the best tests to be done. Not suspecting drug resistance TB is another pitfall by standard of care says all the high risk groups should be screened for MDR TB. Overuse of quinolone is still happens in our community. Use of quinolones preserve it for drug resistance TB. Not addressing the comorbidities and contact. So you must do both inadequate regimen that is pretty common as we can see. Guideline-based treatment is what you should practice, not ensuring treatment adherence and counseling and motivation, inadequate follow-up and monitoring, monitor for treatment response. Notification is a must for all the cases. Okay. So I think private sector has a big role to play as they become aware of how they are contributing in you know, in ending this uh, TB epidemic. So become aware, become responsible, change your attitude. You are very much part of the game and not a new spectator. And most important is don't just stop it acquiring skills and knowledge, but let it come into your behavior and habit. And then you'll surely together be able to conquer TB. This is what Department of Pulmonary Medicine has been doing this by uh, public-private partnership we do at GTB hospital, 
So a lot of training, uh, evidence, collaboration, research, clinical work, and advocacy has happened. This is a TB survival program we have done at TB hospital. And uh, this is the first patient who got started on salvage regimen. It's more than two years she has completed treatment and about 160 patients have been put on uh, salvage regimen and almost 55 to 60% have been cured of the extensively drug resistant. Thank you for your patient. So uh, next talk is uh, so Dr. Mehul will be talking about the treatment uh, treatment pitfalls. So next topics will be covering. Dr. Tarang will be talking on pitfalls in diagnosis. Dr. Mehul would be covering on uh, pitfalls in management, and we'll have one case presentation of TB in critical care. Over to Dr. Mehul. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, depending on whether you guys agree, this could be a really short presentation or a very long presentation. So if you ask people who don't practice tuberculosis, it's very simple to treat TB. And if you ask maybe a pulmonologist, this is a two-day CME. So I'll try to be as concise as possible. Let's start. Case one, young patient from Mumbai, productive cough since three weeks. Occasional minimal squeaky hemoptysis, loss of weight, loss of appetite. So what next? Start AKT4. Start AKT4 plus levoflox. Send sputum test. Start AKT4 and send sputum test simultaneously. I just put the last one just for fun. Refer to a pulmonologist. Kanish is already laughing. Okay. What does the house say? That's it. Don't want to take the option number four. So no option number four. Sorry. Number yeah. Two more commonly. So number two happens most commonly. Someone said, and a little more educated guess would be people start. The option number four, start AKT4 and send sputum test simultaneously. Okay. Case number two, young patient from Thane, cervical uh, swelling since four months gradually increasing. Took three rounds of antibodies from three different doctors, coamoxic lab, levoflox, azithromycin, each five days each at varying intervals. Swelling reduced but present. Somebody did FNAC, showed gynomatous lymphadenitis, likely mycobacterial origin. What next? Again, start AKT4. AKT4 plus levoflox. Do a lymph node biopsy. Start the AKT4 and do a biopsy. And ma'am, now for you, would you still refer or you would you do a biopsy? Biopsy. Okay. Dry cough since four weeks. Feverishness. Father has put on positive tuberculosis six months ago. I don't know whether you can see in the scanogram, there are multiple lymph nodes, they are necrotic. And the radiologist said it is too difficult to biopsy CT guided. Not everybody is lucky enough to have an e bus like we have at Jupiter. Again, the same questions. Yeah, I'll have to add that, sir. Wait for the patient to deteriorate. For you bus. I think all of you know, so I think that should be the end of my presentation. But nobody questioned me here. AKT4, what is the weight band? Weight band. Nobody asked me what is the weight of the patient. Nobody said anything. AKT4 is a brand name. 
which most of the peripheral doctors prescribe. And the doses are not for every. The weight band for AKT4 is for a 45 kg patient. If the patient is weighing 30 kg or 90 kg, AKT4 won't work. And what ma'am was presenting a case from Nagpur, probably the doses were so less that the patient was going to develop drug resistance anyways, because the doses was very, very inaccurate what was given. So before I still go further, I might want to tell you that is it's not over. We have two choices, the red pill or the blue pill. The blue pill means you stay with the ordinary and just refer to the pulmonologist. And the red pill means you commit yourself to understanding the red pill and knowing what is right and what is wrong. So ma'am has already said this, but I'll still stress, when you get a case of tuberculosis, the first thing in doing the treatment is confirming the diagnosis. There have been many times where an effusion is seen and without tapping the AKT is started, it can be a malignancy. We've had cases turn out to be adenocarcinomas, mesotheliomas. So just because there's an effusion in a middle-aged person does not mean this is gonna be TB. So try and get a microbiological diagnosis as much as possible. Even in CNS tuberculosis, you can pester your radiologist, you can pester your CNS colleagues to give you a sample for diagnosis. So first step is confirm the case microbiologically. That is the first pitfall that you see, not confirming. You do an FNAC of the cervical lymph node, you see gunnamidal lymphadenitis, that is not it. According to some studies, particular Hinduja ma'am would agree, in Mumbai, we are a high-risk zone. Almost one-fourth can be primary MDRs. And a retreatment yeah. case was taken to them before. Almost 50% can turn out to be a drug resistance of some kind. So just an FNAC is not enough. So my first advice is get try and get at least attempt to get a microbiological diagnosis wherever you suspect tuberculosis. Where you can't, you can go with a clinical diagnosis if it is not possible. But at every juncture, at, as Pangat sir said, wait for the cervical lymph node to come. If you get it, don't leave it. Send it for histopathology and for culture. So if you see something which is not accessible, try and get a histopath or a culture diagnosis as soon as possible. And since you have committed to the red pill, you can see this is how you have to go through the flow chart. You have to see if there is a case of tuberculosis. If you feel patient is suspect, try and get a sputum examination. Try and get a chest x-ray. If it is positive, currently gene expert or the CB night is available free of cost at all the common centers. And luckily, with the public-private partnership and many private centers also, so try and get a CB night done of a lymph node sample, of a CSF sample, of a bone biopsy, whatever you do. So CB night or a sputum sample, whatever the case may be, try and get a microbiological diagnosis, just showing that if you get microbiome tuberculosis present on a smear or an AFB smear positive is not enough. And once you confirm microbiologically, look out for drug resistance. Even if you see rifampicin sensitive, government is not mad to send first line LPA of every patient. They send it because there's a lot of H mono resistance. When I studied in Jaipur, it was a turn of 33%. I'm sure in Mumbai, the values are similar. So the value of isoniazid drug resistance pattern testing is very, very important. For extra pulmonary tuberculosis, try and get a sample done. Don't start treatment without getting or at least attempting for a sample. So the case that I showed, if I see a lymph node, the patient had taken levofloxacin, patient had taken omoxiclav and azithromycin. The levofloxacin led to some improvement in the patient. That's why the lymph node went down. Try and get a biopsy done. If not, refer to a surgical colleague who can do a biopsy for you. Don't shy away. Patients are going to say, they don't want to do a biopsy. Scar Specifically young females, they don't want scars but you have good plastic surgery colleagues who can help you out later, get a biopsy done. This is not a joke that you're not going to do a microbiological diagnosis. So here again, you see, you have to get a biopsy done or a tissue sample from anywhere. Try and get a CB9. CB9, if it is not detected, at least you have attempted, then you put on appropriate doses. I'll come to the doses and the second pitfall of doses and observe the patient for any improvement or deterioration. Ma'am has already said, so my job is easier. Now, all of us know MDR tuberculosis is rifampicin resistance, but the XDR tuberculosis, the definition has changed. Now we have a pre-XDR where you see a lot of primary fluoroquinolone resistance. So if you see pre-XDR, that means the patient is resistant to rifampicin, plus minus isoniazid and a fluoroquinolone. And 
if you have not a pre xdr but a full xdr tuberculosis then it has to be resistant so the group a drugs will come to the group a drugs and this is the treatment chart all of this is available everywhere you just go on tbc india or you go to ntp website you can find everything no need to take photographs or anything i just here want to just stimulate your brain to realize that you have committed to the red pill there is a lot to learn and tuberculosis guidelines are changing almost every 6 months in fact it is difficult for us to also keep be updated and we rely on our public sector colleagues to keep us updated so i would suggest please be aware of this currently when you saw that regimen of tablet accurate 4 the accurate 4 is different from akt 4 is the same combination as the fdc or the fixed dose combination but government offers but that drug has to be given together you cannot divide accurate for fdc 4 or 4 fdc or 3 fdc in divided doses all drugs have to be taken together so if you see this chart what is given for our 25 to 34 kg you have to give two tablets but the two tablets have to go together it cannot be one morning one evening but if you go to the extreme more than 75 it is six tablets and believe me patients have to take six tablets together or you just don't give fdc you split the drugs don't split the doses now why this fdcs have come a simple funda is people don't know what are the doses this is to simplify the tb treatment in periphery so if you have enough knowledge you know the weight band you have to treat as per weight you can give separate drug isoniazid dipamprosine pyrazinamide ethambutol no problem but give according to the weight band and try to achieve a higher weight band only don't go to the lowest doses if the patient is tolerant just keep a watch for all the liver function abnormalities and ophthal abnormality in children as ma'am mentioned the doses are slightly higher do not under treat do not under dose the patient that is a most common pitfall patients do i see a 60 kg man a lymph node epinephrine showing gonomatous lymphadenitis put on tablet akt4 plus levofloxacin that is the most common we see in periphery if you have not given the proper doses that fifth levoflox is not going to do anything agar pehle char batsman ne kaam nahi kiya hai to niche murli daran six nahi marega you cannot rely on levofloxacin alone to save card your regimen and if it is a sensitive disease your four drugs are sufficient basics of tuberculosis you need first of all to give the best possible drugs those are bactericidal drugs and if the bactericidal drugs are not enough then you add a bacteriostatic drug and at least in the intensive phase four working drugs needs to be given and in the continuation phase at least three drugs needs to be continued till the end of treatment that should be the basic thing drill in your brain four and three even in mdr you will see minimum four and minimum three going on in the you know, continuation phase and this is the new classification of drugs whatever we learned in pg has already changed and since then this is what is currently what is to be remembered maybe it might change in couple of years but currently this is where we are group a drugs are the levoflox or the moxifloxacin bedaquilin and linozolid when you are designing a second line regimen if you are lucky enough to have access to d drugs in private you are supposed to give all the three group a drugs whatever is working in the patient add one or both from the group b drug and then if the regimen is still inadequate add more drugs so you need four drugs minimum which are working in the patient in the initial part at least add first three if you go with the government guidelines the all oral longer regimen that is currently available will have the quinolones bedaquilin linozolid clopazamine cycloserine and if need be adding the other drugs am i correct ma'am yeah but the agent of the enough to have enough to have the private here i would ma'am you are absolutely correct Yes, sir. No, no. No, sir. Like if you, like if you want to give, if I want to give beta kilin, I have no access to beta kilin. but i have made good relationships with all the people who are sitting in the public sector i just have to pick up a phone and tell them ke boss i'm referring a patient this patient is india needs bedaquilin and believe me sir the process is very smooth in one visit you get it so the public private partnership works if it is extra pulmonary pulmonary doesn't matter and in fact 
it is very soon going to be rolled out the BPAL regimen, the shorter regimen which is coming, that will make it even simpler. So accessing the drugs for all may not be possible, even for a pulmonologist like me, but if you send it to the government sector, know when to send, what to send, do the pre-treatment evaluation, the process is very small. Express IV. Express IV. Yeah. And believe me, they are more than willing. If you get most of the patients that you might have seen who are on second line drugs come to us with side effects of neuropathy. You see a linozolate induced toxicity. You just get an NCV done or a neuro opinion done. You write a letter to the uh, NDP executives. They take care of it. They change the drug. They are very prompt in that. So having a public-private partnership is the only way forward. So there was a study, since you're asking, in, done in 1996, where around 60 or 70 private practitioners were assessed, and there were at least 130 different prescriptions given for tuberculosis. Then there were only four or five drugs available. Now we have so many. Imagine we release them in the open market, what will happen? We'll get all kinds of recipes, which probably we won't like. So it's better to have it in a streamlined fashion only. And this is the doses that you need to remember. If by chance you see a public sector executive not writing a proper doses, this is the doses you need to know. So high dose moxifloxin, low dose moxifloxin or normal dose moxifloxin, these all are dependent on the sensitivity pattern. So you have to try and get a liquid culture DST everywhere possible. Any extra pulmonary sample that you take a sample biopsy or any lymph node or any bone biopsy, please send for TB culture, gene expert, that is the CB9, and if possible, the first line LPA at least. Now, I need to stress one point. This is the most important fallacy, what everybody had agreed to. This patient, recent, just in March, suspected to be tuberculosis of the abdomen, ascites were tapped, ADA was 10, so was given an antibiotic course. Finally, patient turned out to be tuberculosis positive. But here you see the fallacy. Patient has been given levofloxin already as a single drug. So levofloxin, if you give alone without the HREZ, there are certain studies we say even for four days, you can get resistance to levofloxin. So if you do suspect tuberculosis, even slightest, do not use quinolones as the drug of choice of antibiotic. And multiple uses of nevofloxin over a period of time have resulted in lower susceptibility. And they have a delay in diagnosis. So that patient of lymph node, which I showed you, was an actual patient. Since the patient was given comoxiclav, did not respond, got levoflox, lymph node reduced in sight, patient went for two months, come hojaega. Then went to another doctor who gave azithromycin, thinking of the upper respiratory, and then the patient landed up with a pulmonologist. So you see the delay in diagnosis which is happening, and this patient is already resistant to quinolones now. And this is the actual studies that I've written. Again, if your patient is drug sensitive, four drugs is sufficient. You don't need to get a bazooka to kill an ant. You cannot give linozolid, levofloxin, if you have bedaquilin, even bedaquilin, amikacin, everything to one patient just because push to kam karega. No, it doesn't work that way. Try and get a diagnosis. Please follow the guidelines. So these are the pearls that I like to say. First and most important, try and get pathological confirmation. Don't rely on histopath. Don't rely on cytology. You may suspect tuberculosis. You may start the AKD. I don't mind you taking a biopsy and starting the TB drugs on that day itself, waiting for the reports to come, but at least attempt to get a microbiological diagnosis done. There have been cases, effusion tap, nothing found. Then I do a lymph node biopsy or an EPUS, which is an extra investigation just to get a microbiological diagnosis done. And combination therapy works as long as your combination makes sense. There are a lot of drug interactions you need to be aware of. People use steroids with AKT in CNS tuberculosis. How many are aware of the drug interactions of steroids with rifampicin? And you know. <laughs> so the steroids dose needs to be doubled. Prednisolone reacts with uh, rifampicin and the dose needs to be twice what you are giving, planning to give. So the dose of prednisolone, if you give 10 milligrams, patient is effectively getting five. So remember that. Many a times I see I have not put that prescription because I thought it would be too much. Prescription from Jupiter Hospital discharge summary where AKT4 was given, 
and tablet B long 100 milligram twice. Now B long is pyridoxine. Let me explain. Pyridoxine is given with isoniazid to prevent peripheral neuropathy. The minimum dose is four to six. You can go up to 10 or 50, depending on the indication. Pyridoxine can inhibit isoniazid. So giving 200 milligrams of pyridoxine along with AKT4, isoniazid is virtually not going to work. So please be judicious in using what combination therapy you're using. So most of the studies have recommended six milligrams. Since we don't get that combination, give, we give 40 ka half. But in pregnant ladies, alcoholics, diabetics, you may go up to 40 milligrams, no problem. But not beyond that. Never add a single drug to a failing regimen. Ma'am just showed a case where AKT was given patient most commonly we see, and I'm sure everybody is facing lymph node tuberculosis, diagnosed rapamycin sensitive, put on proper doses of AKT. After two months or within a month, the lymph nodes are increased in size. What does the doctor do? Get ESR done. ESR is high, add levofloxacin. After 15 days, ESR is still high, add streptomycin. Never add a single drug to a failing regimen. If you want to change the regimen, first get proof. And if you want to change, please add at least three new drugs, which you think probably would be working in the patient. If you're staying in Mumbai, you know what is the drug resistance pattern in Mumbai. Try and stick to that. Do not give levoflox or moxiflox as antibiotics if you are suspecting tuberculosis even 1%. Because even four days of quinolones and patients are going to be resistant to that. And you have 25% primary MDR. Imagine the first x-ray I showed you turned out to be MDR and somebody had given that patient levofloxacin. Now the patient from MDR became pre-XDR. So you are increasing the drug toxicity for the patient because you, now you need to add more drug to the patient. So I'm sure now you are expecting okay, why did I commit to the red pill and not to the blue pill? So you have an option, commit to the blue pill, refer the patient to the public sector. They will take care of it. If you have a pulmonologic colleague who can help you out, refer them to that. Or please be updated with the guidelines. Give judicious drugs, give good weight band related regimens. Do not give nonsense combinations. Do not add drugs just because the patient is not responding. Look for maybe immune reconstitution, maybe for drug resistance. Maybe patient is diabetic. A patient of bilateral pulmonary tuberculosis not responding to treatment could be diabetic, could be HIV positive. You need to investigate for comorbidities before just stepping on the drugs just because you have it in your kitty. And if you have understood it, my work here is done. And this is an actual thank you. Come here. I think uh, Neul has made this look especially for today because you are more likely to listen to Pathan than Mehul. <laughs> so the question is that uh, in today's day and age, anybody diagnosed with TB, I think as a baseline only, diabetes and zero should be checked. Yes. So this is one message I just wanted yeah. to give. In uh, for the first line drugs, man, from 2014, like they are tied up with many practitioners in Mumbai, Thane, they have just started, I guess. So, there they found that when you start doing diabetes and HIV testing, almost 20% undiagnosed cases you are getting of diabetes and HIV in a patient who's walking in with tuberculosis, specifically pulmonary tuberculosis. So, one fifth patient you are missing out if you don't test for sugars and HIV. And government does these tests for free. So you can take those uh, advantage. So based on LFT, um, not for all patients, I would do. I mean, so for the normal, what we have to do, chemotherapy and protein. Exactly. Very, very good is as a stabilized treatment. No more need to guarantee that. So we seek our use of LFT. Right. Sir, uh, one correction I would like to make. When the drugs were instituted, uh, when I was searching for this fallacy of tuberculosis, there is a study in Chess Journal 1936, which has used the word chemotherapy. So we have been considering this as chemotherapy since day one. We have never said they are my antibiotics. They are chemotherapies. Now, that was never said. This is chemotherapy of tuberculosis. 
and sir getting an lft done is okay as long as uh, so just in the private sector trying to get even more tests done becomes sometimes difficult so you clinically judge a patient yes in an ideal scenario lft baseline even creatinine many a times the creatinine is 1.4 1.5 and after revampicin it becomes three Makes sense. I, I think the baseline LFT should be done for, uh, I mean, when you are monitoring the patient for subsequent side effects, how would you know how, how much it has increased? So I'm sure our private patients can afford that much. So, so let's, uh, let's move on to the next session. Thank you, Mehul. Uh, as usual, very, very interesting presentation with his unique style. And now over to Dr. Taran Kulkarni. Uh, so he's also part of the chess department, Jupiter. He'll be talking on busting the diagnostic myths. So most of our myths have already been busted by Dr. Mehul and Dr. Alpha. So I really don't know what I'm going to talk about now. But sure, as in, why not? So there are a few new things which I have actually put in. So, okay. <clears throat> So again, I will also be starting with cases. So 34 year old male, no comorbidities presented to us, presented to local physician with four month history of right cervical lymph node swelling. A UHC guided FNAC was done, which showed ill form granulomas, no cases necrosis and a Montu was 13 millimeters. He was started on first line ETD by his local physician, weight was 72 kgs. So was started on HRCD and liver flocks, so similar to what Dr. Mayhul's patient was. Well, I think it was the same patient. <laughs> <laughs> so, on detailed history, he had a vast history of, uh, of abdominal tuberculosis back in 2013, and uh, but he did not have significant weight gain and he continued to have fever and he was referred to us for further management. So what exactly went wrong here? So what went wrong here, of course, was that he was on wrong, uh, you know, doses for his weight. There was a history of abdominal tuberculosis and uh, we did not have a proper microbiological diagnosis. So my first myth here is that histopathology is enough for diagnosis. We all know that necrotizing granulomas are the basis of diagnosis of tuberculosis, which consists of caseous necrosis, epithelial cells, and Langhans giant cell. But this particular sort of granuloma can be seen in all of these conditions. Of course, in our scenario where uh, the I mean uh, TB is extremely high. TB remains our first diagnosis, but definitely we have been wrong before in the same way that tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, eosinophilic pneumonias, vaginal dermatosis, even fungal infections also seem to present with the similar sort of granulomas. So where is exactly histopath useful? It is especially useful when the bacterial load is low. It has a very poor sensitivity. When you just use histopathology for diagnosis, the sensitivity is close to 63%. And it always has to be interpreted in conjunction with the clinical setting and microbiology. So patient with a lymph node swelling without a fever, if he has caseous granulomas, I would still think twice about, about thing. I would, I would decide about getting a repeat biopsy done. So uh, then the next debate is about whether to do a FNAC or biopsy. So FNAC in, uh, in not in all cases is useless. It's less invasive. And the yield is up to 80% if pus is aspirable. So if your if the lymph node feels boggy, you think that there's pus inside, then probably FNAC could also do the trick. But it also has a poor sensitivity. And if no pus, it loses out on microbiological diagnosis. At the different end of the spectrum, you have the excision biopsy, which is invasive, which is which has a need of anesthesia, has a good yield of on microbiology, even if there is absence of pus. And it also prevents further complications, you know, like the formation of ulcers, sinuses, et cetera. So where does the standard of care lie? The standard of care lies somewhere in between. So this is something that we routinely do uh, in Jupiter. That is a radiology guided through cut biopsy. So it gives you, you know, enough tissue for microbiological evaluation. It is not as invasive as an excision mm -hmm. biopsy. And it seems to do the trick very well on outpatient basis. So my take home message one, is recommended to send all tissue samples obtained from individuals suspected of having tuberculosis in normal cell line for gene expert, TB culture, and, a and AFP stain. And it is important to make every effort possible to obtain a microbiological diagnosis of TB, particularly when it is based on tissue samples. As Dr. Mayol rightly said, 
we should not shy away from performing a second procedure, especially when you don't have a microbial diagnosis. Patients with pleural TB, yes, have has a right upper lobe cavity without not producing sputum. I would not even flinch to do a bronchoscopy in this case. So back to a patient. In the same patient, UHA carried true cut biopsy was done. HP was suggestive of TB, but this patient had MTB detected low and a refer resistance detected. So the second myth is extra pulmonary MDR TB is rare. So previously, yes, it was thought that you know you won't have uh, extra pulmonary MDR. Primarily, it was because extra pulmonary disease is a possible bacillary type of TB. But we have enough observation studies that have estimated in monodrug resistance, especially uh, isoniazid, is close to 15%, whereas MDR extra pulmonary would be close to around 8%. Hence, it becomes even more important now to get a microbiological diagnosis, followed by a good, well-performed DST testing. Then my myth number three is gene expert positivity is enough for diagnosis. I think Dr. Mehul and Dr. Uh, Alpa Ma'am have actually, uh, you know, gone through this chart again. If our uh, gene expert shows that refire resistance is not detected, then the same sample is subjected to a first line LPA. If there is isoniazid monoresistance at uh, to the tune of almost 20 to 30 percent right now in our community, so then you would uh, start the patient on a H mono or a polydrug resistant regime. I won't spend more more time much time because this already has been discussed. So I would like to spend time with this slide. These are all the tests right now which are available for diagnosis of tuberculosis. The highlighted slide generally is Gene Expert and Gene Expert Ultra. So Gene Expert is the first generation, which was the older one, which could detect close to 103 AFB per ml. The sensitivity is around 79%. The specificity is great at 90%. The newer generation expert MTB Ultra detects close to 10 to 12 bacilli per ml. It really performs very well in terms of sensitivity, but the specificity goes down. Now, this is a very important message that I'll come, uh, come to later. Towards the bottom, you have the expert MTB XDR, which we have available in our hospital currently. So this actually gives you sensitivity profile to uh, isoniazid, to fluorquinolones to ethionamide and to second line injectable drugs. Now, what that means is if you send a sample to a good lab, just within 24 hours, you would have a sensitivity profile to four drugs, to rifampicin, isoniazid, fluorquinolones, and, uh, and aminoglycosides, which is good enough for you to make an initial good regimen. Despite all of these tests, where, the, where, the, um, where you have gene sequencing, pyro sequencing, the liquid culture DST, remains the gold standard. So that is something, especially for our residents, is one take home message that we have really brilliant tests right now, but the LCA DST remains gold standard. So my take home message three here would be, so gene expert generally has a better sensitivity in possible bacillary specimens and contrary to popular belief with public private partnership, it is now free of cost at many private chest clinics as well. Expert MTB XDR, which you have been using now, detects resistance for isoniazid, fluorquinolones, and aminoglycosides, but gene expert generally has a lot of false positives too. So if the patient has a past history of, pulm of tuberculosis, it could pick non-replicating and non-viable bacilli also. Now, this is a big problem when you are planning a treatment and you are trying to rule out if the patient is having a relapse or is he having a reinfection. So this question is something which we have to answer only through an AFB culture. So that is the reason a culture with a well-done drug sensitivity testing remains the gold standard and will remain to do so for the for, for next few years. Then I come to case two. So we had a 45-year-old male, so since six months, was having intermittent fever, was having cough, was having weight loss, and was having a lot of fatigue and weakness and joint pain. So this was the, uh, the, the X-ray, and this was the CT scan. As you can see, there are multiple nodules that which can be seen on the x-ray and the ct he was started on atd empirically but did not have any clinical response hence he was actually uh, referred to us so that brings to my fourth myth that is certain radiological findings are nearly pathognomic tuberculosis and can be managed empirically with atd in this particular case the ace levels were 68 there was a raised serum calcium and 24 hour urinary calcium bronchoscopy with a transbronchial lung biopsy were done where the tissue gene expert and the AFB culture was negative. And of course, the transbronchial lung biopsy shows non casein granuloma suggestive of pulmonary sarcoidosis. So again, based on radiological features, 
you cannot decide if you have to treat this patient with uh, with empirical ATDs. So uh, I'm, I'm sure all of us are aware of this miliary nodules on imaging. It could be infectious, of course, TB, certain, uh, you know, certain fungal, rare fungal infections also could give you miliary uh, nodules. Malignancies from thyroid, kidney, sarcomas could also present with miliary nodules. And other uh, causes like sarcoidosis, hemocytosis, hypersensitive pneumonitis generally also could produce with miliary nodules on imaging. So my take home message for the first is controversial. I would like everyone to chip in here. In modern day pulmonology, is there still a role for empirical ATD? So for someone who believes a lot in interventional pulmonology, I think so not. The guidelines still have a provision for clinically diagnosed tuberculosis, but it should be considered only and only if all the diagnostic avenues have been exhausted. It is advisable to avoid treating solely on radiological findings. Instead, we should make all efforts to rule out other potential etiologies. Then I come to the third case. So this was a 38 year old male who presented to me in the OPD and with a strongly positive TB gold quantiferon assay. He had no cough, no fever, no weight loss, no loss of appetite. The chest radiograph was normal, but the patient was convinced that he had tuberculosis because he had read it up on Google. So that brings to my fifth myth that um, having a positive TB gold or a Montu test generally indicates active TB disease. So both of these tests, that is the TB gold and the Montu test, measure immune sensitization to the mycobacterial protein. It just measures exposure. It, it may not act, uh, indicate active disease. So where is TST and IGRA relevant currently? So for this, we have to understand the concept of TBI and TB disease. These are actually new terminologies which have been published in the recent guidelines. So TB infection, which is a newer term, Previously, it was called as LTBI, that is latent tuberculosis infection, is a state where there is evidence of positive TST or IGRA, IGRA is interferon gamma release assay, in the absence of signs and symptoms. Whereas TB disease, or previously called as active tuberculosis, is presence of signs and symptoms reflecting illness to mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, who do we screen for TB infection? TB diagnosis to okay. People come to us with, uh, with cough, shortness of breath, with, uh, with weight loss. But who do we screen for TB infection? So we recently have these guidelines by the government of India, which say that people living with HIV and household contacts of, of TB patients. Now they should be screened for, uh, for uh, TB infection. Similarly, patients who are on immunosuppressive therapy who are having silicosis on anti-TNF treatment on dialysis or preparing for organ or hematological transplantation should also be screened for TB eyes with IGRAS and MONTU test. Now, this is extremely controversial because when you talk about household contacts for more than five years of age with a positive TST or IGRA, that is almost every. So once you have the target population, the first step is to rule out active TB. So how what we do in our practice is for sputum positive cases, we at least uh, get a, a chest X-ray done for the, for the close contacts. If there are no signs of TB, then you test for TB infection, that is through TST or IGRA, and then you evaluate for tuberculosis preventive therapy. If there are no contraindications for tuberculosis preventive therapy, then you start tuberculosis preventive therapy. Now, what do we exactly try to give in this? So it's either six months of isoniazid or the newer, new launch, three month weekly dose of isoniazid and rifapentin. So right now it is it hasn't been yet started, at least not in Thane. But a six-month daily dose of isoniazid is generally useful to, target, to treat the patients, to give a tuberculosis preventive therapy in the target population. So take-home message five, uh, uh, tuberculosis skin testing or IGRA may not indicate TB disease, and it has to be interpreted carefully in context of the clinical scenario. It is important to screen, screen close contacts of, of patients with TB disease and it should be offered only after rolling out active tuberculosis. So why are we doing this? Because right now with the NTB program, prevention is one of the four strategic priorities of a national strategic program. So this, I, I understand this is, this is extremely controversial and not even amongst the seniors, you know, uh, there is, we still haven't reached a consensus on whom to treat and not to treat. I would really like the seniors in the audience to comment about it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm almost done. Okay, I'm almost done. So then, uh, the, this is, I think, the last case. Yeah. So, 23 year old biopsy revealed a drug sensitive disease, and she was started on HRZD as per her weight. So, everything went well. So, that actually is my final myth. That is one sensitive, sensitive throughout. That is an understanding that we used to have before. There, but there was an initial response to her treatment with an increase in weight and reduction in size of nodes. But after three months, she started losing weight and started persisting fever. The size of the lymph node also started to increase in size. So what do we do next? So this is again from our new index TV guidelines. If there, if there is an increase in the size of the lymph node with signs of inflammation, we have to check the old culture reports and if possible, send new cultures. If the repeat cultures show there is susceptive TB, it can either be paradoxical worsening. If it is drug resistance, of course, then you have to refer to the DRTB center. But the fun is in when it is still a susceptible disease. Because in this particular case, you show what we do generally is therapeutic drug monitoring. We send serum levels for isoniazid and rifampicin. And in case if even after that, the patient is still having these nodes, then uh, generally anti-inflammatory therapy like steroids could be needed with an understanding that we might be dealing with a paradoxical response. So my take home message is that amplification of resistance is possible. So non-responders should be resampled for drug resistance. If sensitive, then a thera therapeutic drug monitoring. And if that is also okay, then an immuno, immuno anti-inflammatory therapy like steroids could be used in this case. So this is my last slide. So important to make every effort possible to obtain a micro diagnosis with private partner partnership, private public partnership. Gene expert is now free and at private chest clinics too. Gene expert MTB XTR, very helpful. AFB culture and DST remains the gold standard. It is important to screen cold uh, close contacts of TB disease and TBs, TST and IGRA uh, generally should be interpreted with caution. Uh, we make sure to measure serum isoniazid and rifampicin levels to, and then rule out paradoxical reaction, especially in bond responders. Thank you so much. Thank you for that excellent and comprehensive presentation. So now we have last one from Department of Test Medicine, a short presentation by our DNB student, Dr. Alina. She'll be presenting a case uh, managed in a critical case. Dr. Manas could not be present. He had to go out somewhere. So she will, she, Dr. Arina will present the case. A warm good evening to all. Myself, Dr. Arina Vergis. I am a second year DNB resident in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine. I am here to present a case which was recently admitted under us. What all challenges we had to face in this case, and a brief note on what all the possible reasons a patient of tuberculosis might line up in the ICU. So, coming on to the case, I would like to start by a quote: "Defer no time, delays have dangerous ends." Coming on to the case, she is a young female, 21 years old, no comorbidities in the past, educated. She came to us with symptoms of cough, breathlessness, intermittent fever, generalized weakness, loss of appetite with significant weight loss. This was going over for around three months. Patient came to us with sudden worsening of the respiratory symptoms. Even though she was having symptoms since three months, there was no past history of any PTB or pulmonary tuberculosis contact. And patient had a X-ray picture. So as you can see, she has bilateral extensive infiltrates with the right-sided pneumothorax. The right border of the lung is clearly visible in this patient. And on presentation also, she was tachycardic. Her BP was on the lower side, clinically absent breath sounds. We had done an HRCT of this patient, and you can see that there is extensive involvement of the right, right lung, both of the lungs, more in the right side, dense consolidation with cavitation within. Even the uh, left lung is not completely normal. We had, uh, we had evaluated for the same. This is a second picture. So the challenge was the patient was having hemodynamic compromise due to extensive disease. The patient had intractable tachycardia with severe hypoxemia and hypotension. First thing we did was put an ICD on the right side, but post tachycardia, we thought we would uh, expect some amount of reduction in the tachycardia, but the tachycardia still persisted. We decided to start on empirical first line antituberculous treatment based on her weight band since we didn't have any sample and bilateral extensive disease and a city like Mumbai this, and the symptoms. First thing that will come to our mind is tuberculosis. 
she was given low stress dose of iv corticosteroids and we th thought about investigating further if she has some other secondary cardiac causes which might be leading to the tachycardia so we did a two echo for her it showed severely depressed left ventricular ejection fraction of 10 to 15% we generalized lv wall hypokinesia the tropi came to be positive the high anti propnp levels were seen so this rule this came to a suspicion of tb myocarditis in this patient so we consulted with our cardiologist she, uh, she was initiated on digoxin antidiuretics and other heart failure medication so the hemodynamic compromise right now was being uh, been treated but the next thing is she is having extensive disease and we don't know the cause even if it is tuberculosis we don't know it's drug sensitive or drug resistant and the patient was not producing any sputum we wanted to do a bronchoscopy for her but in her case because her todico was uh, with a low ejection fraction it will be high risk to do a bronchoscopy so we tried doing sputum induction with mucolytic agents nebulization but it could not be done in the first two days then with the help of our physiotherapy team therapy team bronchoscopy in this patient so the sputum results came afp3 plus the culture which usually takes 6 weeks to reporting in this patient it came early the gene expert showed detected high now we had the second problem it was rifampicin resistance we were fortunate enough to do the second line of uh, investigations expert xdr which showed additional resistance to isoniazid along with fluoroquinolone of course because the patient had extensive disease we had to rule out if she has any type 2 diabetes or type 2 type 1 or is there any viral marker immunodeficiency state in this patient even an autoimmune workup was done which all came to be negative now starting a second line att means inviting a lot of problems because most of the medicines have one or the other drug interaction with the cardiac medicines and one of the most uh, toxic i would say the cardiotoxicity related to the att so what we did was stepwise introduction of the second line att we had initiated on linazolid cycloserin moxifloxacin and injection amikacin this moxifloxacin was later stopped because fluoroquinolone resistance was seen we modified after the export xdr reports then the introduction of bedaquiline clofazamine delamanid was done in a phased manner we had to do her daily qtc monitoring we had to check for her electrolyte disturbances we had to constantly look for any drug to drug interactions in this patient she even developed an episode of svt prior getting discharge which was requiring cardio wash so the ongoing challenges are the patient's icd removal we would we were able to do within 10 days we could do her pulmonary re rehabilitation she was sent home without oxygen supplementation the tachycardia was resolved we took care of the nutritional support as well counseling the patient also we could achieve a weight gain of 2 kg in this patient the two day echo was repeated prior to discharge which came out to be normal we could finally place the patient on a complete regimen we could counsel the family members because the treatment is going to be in a long run 18 to 20 months so we actually counsel the family members regarding all the aspects what all areas should be looked out for and of course contact screening of all the family members related to this patient so this is the x ray when she presented to us and this is the x ray after the icd removal as you can see the pneumothorax is more or less resolved but right now the infiltrates are still there and we are actually following up this patient in the opd so i would like to just talk briefly on what are the possible reasons a tuberculosis patient can end up in icu it can be because of the disease itself extensive disease and even ards can also be seen in pulmonary tuberculosis patient pneumothorax empyema as seen in this patient we lost two patient because of sepsis respiratory failures both type 1 and type 2 massive hemoptysis even paradoxical reactions in patients who are initiated on att and bronchopleural fistula extra pulmonary tuberculosis especially cns tb uh, is a very difficult to treat entity disseminated disease pericardial effusion with tamponade tb myocarditis pulmonary thromboembolic phenomenon can is also possible adrenal crisis either if because of the directly affecting the adrenal gland or secondary to the infection and treatment related areas like in this patient we had arrhythmias qt prolongation fulminant hepatic failure mostly in patients who are put on first line att we have seen patients with fulminant hepatic failure acute kidney injury those who are on injectables severe anemia with bone marrow suppression 
lactic acidosis in patients who are on linozolate, severe psychosis because of some of the second line medicines. And this doesn't end here. Post TB circulate also, patient can come to us with TOPD, with type 2 respiratory failure, extensive post TB fibrosis. Patient with a large cavity can develop hemoptysis in the future. That cavity itself can be a host to different organisms. So that can lead to secondary infections in a post TB lung. So all of these causes can lead to hospitalization of a TB patient in an ICU. I would like to end the note by a theme of 2023 TB day. We can, yes, we can end TB. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alina, for that excellent presentation. So here, highlighting the public-private partnership. No, this kind of patient could not have been uh, treated in the public sector. And uh, we had to get access of the newer drugs through the public sector, and we could manage this patient and that too with multi-specialty team involvement. And think, I'm so glad that we have created this algorithm and our students are also now following that algorithm and are able to manage the patient now. Yeah, thank you so much for giving this opportunity. And now I want to the medicine team for adult vaccination. Thank you, Pulmonology Department. We learned a lot. We gained a lot of insights on tuberculosis and its management. Indeed, fantastic sessions. So now what was something lighter? We've all had our COVID vaccinations. So I believe, young doctors, how many amongst you have taken your flu shots? None. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, I mean... <laughs> Okay, so let's begin our presentation with a case. So this was a patient who was a 66-year-old male teacher, diabetic, asthma. He, had, he was living a very healthy lifestyle playing with his grandchildren, but he was admitted with a five-day history of fever, cough, and worsening of breathlessness. His X-ray did show that he had a lobar consolidation in the right middle zone as well as the lower zone, and he was empirically treated with ceftriaxone, azithromycin, and antiflu. So the blood culture showed strep pneumonia, which was pan-sensitive. You could see that in the pictures. Uh, but despite of being in the right antibiotics, the right dose, the patient worsened on day five. He went into sepsis. He was intubated. Multi-organ failure ensued. VAP, API, critical illness, polyneuropathy, tracheostomy, and long-term hospital stay. So at what cause did it come? And could we have taken the preventive steps? As physicians, is our duty or is our prescription only limited to writing anti-diabetic drugs, to prescribing inhalers, to counseling about lifestyle? Or is does that go something beyond that? So yes, the answer is adult vaccination. Yes, adults need vaccination and the role of adult vaccination is proven well in the post-COVID era. So adult vaccination is the need of the hour. It does prevent mortality and morbidity due to vaccine-preventable diseases. And we need to remember that vaccine is not universal. So some vaccines are for nature, by one shoe doesn't fit all, okay? So it depends what kind of vaccine you should take, depends on your age, your risk factors, whether you're a diabetic, you have a COAD, you have a heart failure, whether you're immunocompromised, whether you're pregnant or no, what's your profession, what's your travel status, and whether or not you're a solid organ trans uh, recipient or no, because the requirement of vaccination, timings, the doses, everything is drastically different in these patients. So it has a huge impact on the quality of life of comorbid patients, and this aspect of practice should not be neglected in our routine OPD visits. So these are the sets of vaccination which are now recommended in adults. So the different guidelines endorsed by CDC, ASIP, API guidelines, we have the Geriatric Society of India, the RSSDI guidelines. And what are they? The annual flu vaccination, pneumococcal vaccination, TDAP vaccination, MMR, chickenpox, varicella zoster, hepatitis A, B, mening typhoid, meningococcal, jab B vaccines, cervical cancer vaccines, specific travel-related vaccinations, and according to clinical recommendations. But as we remember that we need to choose our patient and we need to vaccinate him with the appropriate vaccinations. So over to our first vaccine, that is our streptococcus pneumonia. So we have two types of uh, the pneumococcal vaccine. The one is a conjugate vaccine and one is a polysaccharide vaccine. So about 20 serotypes of streptococcus, um, uh, they account for fatal uh, invasive pneumococcal diseases. 
So, uh, we have a very beautiful study which was published in CMC Vellore and which states that uh, invasive pneumococcal diseases continues to be a problem in India and is associated with high case fatality rate in spite of treatment in a good hospital setting. Though the penicillin resistance is extremely low and more than 80% of the serotype group type uh, strains causing the disease in the elderly are included in the formation of the vaccine. So that, uh, you know, that kind of focuses what the importance of vaccination is. So as we all know, the pneumococcal disease, we have a non-invasive and we have an invasive form. A non-invasive uh, uh, form which is restricted to pneumococcal pneumonia, but we, in some patients who are, um, uh, you know, who, are, who have lots of comorbid conditions, it can progress to uh, having uh, bacteremia meningitis. So it can turn out to be an invasive pneumococcal syndrome, which has got a very high mortality. So these are the uh, studies which uh, show how high the uh, mortality in invasive pneumococcal infections is. So this is a pneumococcal disease burden in India. A prospective 15-year surveillance of invasive bacterial infections in India showed S pneumonia infection as an important cause in about 43% of the cases with a case fatality rate from 25 to 30% ranging in all the adult groups. So in most of the cases of community acquired pneumonia, streptococcus pneumonia is still the primarily identified uh, cause of community acquired pneumonia. So these are various studies uh, which quote the primary rates of streptococcal or the prevalence of S pneumonia in uh, uh, community acquired pneumonia. Now, to, now this is a double trouble. So these are studies which shows that uh, there are adverse outcomes of an S pneumonia after an influenza infection and vice versa. So S pneumonia had 125 times increased odds of having severe influenza and vice versa. So patients, if you have a patient who has got influenza initially and who comes to you 15 to 20 days down the line with sepsis and lobar consolidation, then it is likely to be a pneumonia, uh, S pneumonia consolidation. So for uh, uh, the organisms, they are a double trouble. So who are the patients who should be offered the pneumococcal vaccine? So any patients with comorbid conditions are long-standing diabetics, right? So in diabetic OPDs, there is a very clear-cut indication of administering pneumococcal vaccination to high-risk populations. Patients with COPDs, patients with asthma, patients with cystic fibrosis, bronchitis, interstitial lung disease, CKD patients, patients with uh, CLDs, patients who are long-time cigarette smokers, also patients pre splenectomy or who have a functional or an anatomical asplenia and patients with the cochlear implants or patients with a cerebrospinal leak. So these all candidates are eligible to receive the pneumococcal um, vaccination. So uh, this was the largest, uh, uh, you know, the trial which was conducted, the CAPITA trial. Uh, so this has been the largest ever vaccine trial which enrolled almost 84,000 uh, patients. And uh, this was a phase four randomized uh, double control trial. And it did prove beyond doubt the efficacy of, uh, you know, the pneumococcal conjugated vaccine in preventing an invasive pneumococcal disease. <clears throat> so what are our Indian guidelines as far as our pneumococcal vaccination is concerned? So what in India we still practice is that for all the patients above uh, 65 years, we administer a conjugate vaccine. That is the PCV-13 is administered. And after one year, they receive the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. Okay, So this is followed still in India. Though the latest CDC guidelines have changed last year, in the US, what they uh, is available is a PCV-15. So they give a PCV-15 followed uh, one year after by uh, the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine or a single lifetime shot of PCV-20 is good enough, uh, followed by no further pneumococcal vaccination. However, this is yet to be available in India. So as of now, we stick to our old uh, formula that is in all the high-risk comorbid patients, we administer a conjugate vaccine first because it is more immunogenic as compared to the polysaccharide vaccine. After one year, we administer the Pneumovac 23. So in patients who are more than 65 and with all the comorbidities whom I just enlisted. So these were the patients who are uh, eligible recipients uh, for pneumococcal vaccine. So what are the vaccines which are universally recommended by the Associated Physicians of India, API recommendations, D DPG, MMR, influenza, pneumococcal vaccine, HPV vaccines, and zoster vaccines. 
So now case to a pregnant patient is simple, which who comes to our OPD for the first consult, no significant comorbidities. Which vaccines will you offer and which are which are vaccines are contraindicated? Residents, any take? Which vaccine? Simple, pregnant patient in your OPD. Which vaccines will you offer? So yes, two vaccines. One is the TT. So now we no longer uh, administer a TT vaccine. TT is replaced by TDAP. Okay. So TT is replaced by TDAP and we administered a flu vaccine, which is an inactivated uh, vaccine. So let's go over to the uh, flu vaccine. It is a quadrivalent vaccine. So who uh, are the eligible recipients? So all the healthcare workers should receive our annual flu shots. Okay, so we have been, last few months, we have seen a huge number of H1N1 cases. We have seen a huge number of H3N2 cases. And many patients with comorbid conditions, with chronic heart failure were in the ICU. They progressed, you know, to have a very long ICU stay. So yes, the severity of the sickness can definitely be prevented by annual and timely flu shots. So these are the indications, diabetes, CLDs, CKDs, patients on hemodialysis, asthma, uh, CCF, pregnant patients, and all the healthcare workers. So what is a flu vaccine? It is a third generation. It's a subunit vaccine. So what is subunit vaccine? These vaccines have a better tolerability and lesser reactogenicity. So why do we need to take it annually? We all know that there is an antigenic drift in the uh, flu strain. So therefore, we need to uh, take your flu shots every year. So now some people will say that which time is the right time to vaccinate. So we have two sets of vaccine, one which comes in the Northern Hemisphere and one which comes in the Southern Hemisphere. So the Northern Hemisphere vaccine comes somewhere in the month of February and the Southern Hemisphere somewhere in the month of October. But in Bombay, we see a good number of flu cases, you know, in the monsoon uh, time and a small peak, you know, uh, at the, in the winter seasons. So any time when there is a new uh, vaccine that is available, that uh, opportunity should be seized and uh, we should administer the flu vaccine uh, to our patients who comes to the OPD. So yes, WHO recommends annual flu vaccines for pregnant patients, children between six months to five years, elderly individuals, patients with chronic medical conditions and healthcare workers. In pregnant women, the uh, benefit doesn't even extend only to the mother, but it also reduces the rates of illnesses in the infants for the first six months of life. Okay, so that also needs to be noted. What is the composition of the flu vaccine? It's a quadrivalent vaccine. So it contains two flu A strains, that is uh, two strains of H1N1, H3N2 for that year. And second one is the two flu B strains, that is a Victoria and the Yamagata lineage. So what are the contraindications? Well, not much. Only history of previous GBS following a vaccination, prior episode of anaphylaxis following vaccination, and severe egg allergy. Now, in the US, we do have a recommended uh, flu vaccine which is available, which is not still available in India. But whenever it is available, we can offer it to our patients uh, with, uh, you know, with egg allergy. Now, some people will say, uh, why do we vaccinate? You know, because flu ka vaccine to diya, but fir bhi illness hota hai. You know, kuch farak nahi padta hai. We still end up getting fevers. But no, the protective value in different studies ranges between 35 to 70 percent. But Annual and regular vaccination reduces the burden of flu in the community and it prevents hospitalization with severe disease and also invasive pneumococcal in infections as a byproduct. So go, going over to the next vaccine, yes, this is the second vaccine which the patient, uh, which a pregnant patient should uh, receive. So one is a Tdap vaccine. So the dose is one dose of Tdap followed by TT every 10 years. So what are the indications apart from pregnancy? Again, it is recommended in healthcare workers and uh, in the 2021 COPD guidelines, all patients with COPD also need to be updated with their boostrix vaccinations. And what is the contraindication to boostrix is only history of prior encephalopathy related to vaccination. So now this is health three, uh, 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 the third uh, case. A healthcare worker who comes to us as a physician, his immunos immunization status is unknown. So our nurses who come to us and they say, hey, doctor, we want to get ourselves vaccinated. What are the vaccines as physicians we should or as doctors we should offer? So these are the sets which are offered to the healthcare workers. Flu vaccine, Tdap, hepatitis B vaccine, MMR vaccine. We just saw a recent surge in the MMR cases and we have our ICU nurses who look after immunocompromised patients and measles is a very rapidly infectious or contagious disease. So imagine a patient being exposed to measles 
Yeah, so therefore it is important that all our healthcare workers should be vaccinated with the MMR vaccine and varicella vaccine because uh, especially uh, for the immunocompromised patients who are at a risk of chicken pox. So hepatitis B vaccine, very important vaccine. It's a recombinant vaccine. Uh, the dose is 20 mics in the normal individuals. It's always to be given in the deltoid because it's got no immunogenic value if you, uh, if you vaccinate it on the, uh, uh, on the buttocks. So it's given in the deltoid, the routine schedule is 0, 1, and 6. And it's very, very important to have a demonstrable levels of protective antibody after the HBS vaccination. So don't leave the patient. Ideally, after two months, we check for the anti-HBS anti -HB, titers, and they are meant to be more than 10 units. So if in case there are not, then it's time to repeat the entire series of the, uh, uh, the hepatitis B vaccination. The second indication is all patients with CKD, CLD, patients on dialysis, patients awaiting transplants, patients who have high-risk behaviors, HIV positive patients, spouses of HBSAG positive patients, and in conditions which require recurrent blood transfusions like thalassemias, leukemias, aplastic anemias, all these patients should receive their um, the hepatitis B shots. So what are the protective values? The different studies uh, have pooled studies show protective immun uh, immunity 30, 75 and 90 percent after a first, second and a third dose respectively. Okay. So post vaccination screening is mandatory in high risk individuals like those who are under undergoing a liver transplant or in patients with CKD and these antibody levels should be checked after two months. So what are the levels which we uh, desire in CKD patients? The levels of more than 100. What do we do for non-responders? Non we repeat the dose. And for uh, CKD patients, uh, the dose of vaccination, we give the double the dose of vaccination. So the normal dose is 20. In CKD patients, it is 40. And we also have super accelerated regimens wherein rapid achieving in titers is required. So now this is an MMR vaccine. Now this, we need to know that this is a live vaccine. So MMR, Varicella vaccine, uh, these are all the, uh, uh, the live vaccines. So they are contraindicated in pregnancy and in patients who have got severely immunocompromised conditions. So patients with who are on higher doses of steroids or patients who are on uh, who are zero positive with CD4 counts of less than 100. So these vaccinations are uh, contraindicated. What about hepatitis A vaccine? So this is usually available either as a standalone vaccine or in combination with hepatitis B, that is a twin rings. So in which category of patients is hep A vaccine uh, recommended? In all patients with CLD, patients awaiting liver transplants, patients exhibiting high risk behavior, free travel to highly endemic area. So if you have a patient who wants to go on a pilgrimage, we should know what kinds of or what sets of vaccines need to be given to him. Similarly, hep A vaccination is recommended for patients receiving clotting factors like hemophiliacs and post-exposure prophylaxis. So herpes zoster vaccine. So this, the purpose of giving a herpes zoster vaccine is to prevent a post-herpetic neuralgia. So till now, we had the live attenuated vaccine uh, 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 that was a Zostavax, but soon we are going to have the Shingrix uh, which is a recombinant vaccine. So herpes zoster, which it is important uh, to, uh, to be uh, offered to all our patients, especially who are diabetics and over 50 years of age and patients who are on DMARDS. So this is uh, the very uh, important area uh, wherein uh, the herpes zoster vaccine needs to be administered. Similarly, the chickenpox vaccine, the varivax vaccine, the indication is again healthcare workers and all adults who have not naturally exposed to the infection and post exposure prophylaxis in vulnerable hosts. So if you come across a patient who is having chicken pox and you're not sure of whether you've had chicken pox as a child or no, it's better to take the chicken pox vaccine. So case for patients with rheumatoid arthritis on HCQS salazopyrin. So what are the vaccines that you recommend in these patients? So yes, we give them the pneumococcal shots, the flu shots, the Tdap vaccines, the Hep B, Hep A vaccines, and the varicella zoster vaccine if they are on high doses of steroids or on prolonged doses of DMARDs. So again, case 5, 16-year-old adolescent female wishing to travel abroad for further studies. Which vaccines will you recommend? So yes, HP vaccines is uh, uh, administered to females uh, before the onset of, even to males before the onset of their sexual activity. It's a three-dose series. We administer a uh, meningococcal vaccine, flu vaccines, Tdap, MMR vaccines, and lastly, the COVID vaccine. I've not included COVID vaccine as a part of the talk because our focus was mainly on the adult vaccination beyond the COVID. 
Now, meningococcal vaccine, yes, uh, there are two types, the polysaccharide and the conjugate vaccine. So what are the indications during an outbreak, during an inter-epidemic period, and to uh, travelers, pilgrims, and patients, people attending fairs and festivals. So now the last case, uh, uh, we have a 50-year-old male who is scheduled for an elective splenectomy. So which are the vaccines which we offer and what is the timing of vaccination? So yes, the vaccines which are offered pre-splenectomy are an annual flu shot. Second is a HIV, that is a H influenza B. It's a single dose vaccine. Then we offer a meningococcal conjugate vaccine and the 13 valent or the Prevnar or the uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. What is the timing? It's two weeks before the procedure. Or if the patient lands up with an emergency splenectomy, we should wait for seven to 10 days before the patient stabilizes, his immunity is up and then offer him the complete sets of vaccination. So, and follow-up vaccination in post patients is very important because uh, they uh, are, uh, you know, they play a very important role in preventing uh, overwhelming post splenectomy infections. So, this is a summary which you can follow, find out on the internet, and this is the ASAP guidelines of adult immunizations. The other vaccines are jab B vaccines. If you're traveling to a uh, uh, endemic area, a typhoid vaccine, uh, oral three doses, one week apart, cholera vaccines, oral doses, uh, two weeks apart. So if, especially if you're going on to a, a pilgrimage, these vaccines should be offered. Rabies vaccination, post wild animal bites, and yellow fever vaccination. So thus, a high burden of vaccine-preventable diseases, increasing elderly population, immunosenescence, and emerging drug resistance emphasize the need for a robust adult vaccination in India. While uh, uh, immunization guidelines from various societies uh, internationally uh, exist, there is inadequate implementation of the same. So we need to develop a sound ecological system for adult vaccination in India by spreading awareness amongst doctors and patients. So further to the policy of our patient first, we have, as, a, as a medicine department of Jupiter Hospital, we are committed to providing holistic care to all our patients. We have a vaccine passport, uh, which is uh, ready. So all our patients who are eligible to receive the adult vaccinations can walk in our OPD. I would like uh, Dr. Saraf, our uh, director, to enlighten us uh, by a couple of words. And uh, yes, vax to the max to all your deserving patients. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dhanashri. I I I am Any small small day vaccine oral. Thank you, Dharashik. I think it was a wonderful talk. Uh, I, I mean, the entire, the pillars of our entire schedule, the program have been Dharashik and Kanishka. A big round of applause to them because it was their vision, their policy. They were trying, working very hard on this entire booklet. The passport was an idea of Ankit. He said that if we can craft it looking like a passport, it's easy to carry, it's easy, it's pocket-sized. The last page is a summary page. So every time our nurse puts in, gives in a vaccination, she puts in the details on the last page that populates over the period of time. It has a good summary sheet at the end. Uh, the details of the vaccination, Tanishka has made a good pictorial representation. And over the last six, eight months, they both have taken references international guidelines, national guidelines, spoken to Dr. Soman, many other people around. So I think it's a great passport to have. All of you, we would request, take a copy, go through it and start, you know, for our patients, for ourselves, I think it's a very important uh, thing to get vaccinated. Thank you, Dhanashri. I think I welcome Dhanashri. Thank you, Dhanashri. Thank you, Dhanashri. Thank you,
Yeah. So basically, before I get into this uh, presentation, there's only one thing I want to stress is that uh, despite knowing all about vaccinations, uh, we don't vaccinate as many people as we should. So actually, execution and implementation implementation is the problem because this was not a habit during our student days. So it's not part of our muscle memory and all. So more important than anything else that uh, me and Dhanashri say here is just go through the passport. Each physician here should go through the passport and see which patients of his, which vaccine is applicable and just try to incorporate that into your uh, in your prescription. So as part of our prescription, there's always a treatment part. There should also be a prevention part. We should have vaccination and uh, that is the most important thing. So uh, just when we were kind of uh, making this passport and all, what it occurred to us is that uh, practically every second or every third patient who enters a general medicine OP deserves a vaccine and 99% are not getting it. So that should now slowly start changing. So the most important thing is to see which vaccine will be applicable to you in your practice. So like Alpha Ma'am is here, so she should think, okay, which of my patients will need COPD patients, diabetes, that way. So yeah, yeah. so that number should increase even from medicine side, I think. So uh, that's one thing. Then. Uh, uh, so my topic is vaccination in special populations. So I'll just get to that. So uh, this was from the movie Taken. How many of you have seen this movie? <laughs> so this this dialogue from the movie became very famous because this this actor uh, played a CIA officer whose uh, daughter gets kidnapped in Paris. And he gets the opportunity to talk to the kidnapper. So he tells him that I don't have this and I don't have that. All I have is a very specific set of skills. And I will find you and I will kill you. So instead of that, we are trying to vaccinate people. <laughs> but with the same kundas. <laughs> so uh, special population means what? Means vaccination in special population. Everybody is special or some people are more special. So uh, any situation in which vaccination may not give a good response or situation in which vaccine may actually harm. So the, these are the situations which we need to be more careful uh, when to vaccinate, uh, what to give and whom to give. So these are called as the special situations. So mainly it is divided into pregnancy and other immunocompromised states. Uh, and the broad point here will be that in immunosuppressed people, the vaccine uh, response will not be good. Immunogenicity will not be good. And if we give live vaccines, there is a danger of uh, getting vaccine disease as well. So broadly, we have to think this way that you know, in immunocompromised you know, patients, uh, try to avoid the live vaccines and try to defer the inactive weighted vaccines also to a certain degree as much as possible based on the clinical situation. If the patient's immunity is likely to improve in the next few weeks, next few months, then you can wait till then and then vaccinate so that the immunogenicity is better. So basically, solid organ transplants, bone marrow, autoimmune, malignancy, and uh, splenectomy are the groups. Why is it more important uh, in this uh, population? Because they are at higher risk of infections, including the vaccine preventable infections, and that they are at higher risk for the severe disease. So, even though vaccines may work lesser and may actually harm in these patients, they are the ones who need it when it is appropriate more than even the normal person. Because, suppose, you know, uh, in a fit patient, you get in a young fit patient, you get some infection, you're not so worried. In a post kidney transplant patient with uncontrolled diabetes and multiple other medicines he's on, he gets influenza or a pneumococcal, really scared, right? So uh, these populations uh, need better uh, this thing. So now this is just uh, to illustrate uh, one thing that as the period from vaccination starts increasing, 
the efficacy uh, tends to uh, come down. Uh, so this is uh, with regards to the COVID one. So after 12 months, the efficacy has come down from 90% to 50 and 25 for the Moderna's and Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, right? So this DK, this vaccine DK, is actually accelerated in an immunocompromised patient. So this happens in all individuals, but this DK is even more accelerated in an immunocompromised patient. Uh, so this is why it's more important. Now, broadly inactivated and live, right? So, easy way to remember is uh, there are very few live vaccines. So, by heart, those, the rest of those are, rest of the rest are all inactivated. So, no problem. So, live ones are varicella, MMR, BCG, yellow fever, nasal influenza, and zoster, right? So, these are the only live ones. Huh? All back, everything else is inactivated. So, live vaccines uh, we cannot give in severely immunocompromised patient. Risk of vaccine-induced disease is there. Timing of the vaccine is important to prevent the vaccine-induced disease. And in the inactivated can be safely given in all patients. There is no risk of vaccine-induced disease. But timing is important in order to maximize efficacy. Huh? So, with that, I'll go ahead. So, now... Even in the immunocompromised states, you can kind of divide into mild, moderate, and severe. And generally, the patients will go uh, in this kind of fashion. They won't go from normal to straight away severe immune suppression. They will go through a period of mild to moderate in most clinical situations. So, suppose a person, uh, 50, 45, 50 year old, has come with a diabetes. Now, uh, he's right now uncontrolled. Later on, he may get controlled. But uh, he's already showing some signs of retinopathy, nephropathy. Some microalbuminuria is there. So, he is somebody who may go on to DKD, CKD, many other things. So, right now is the best time to vaccinate him. Don't wait for him to develop a creatinine of 3 and 5. And uh, then go for transplant and all that. So, the best time to vaccinate is early when patient is having very mild or moderate immune suppression because this is when your vaccines will work also and uh, uh, even the live ones as needed you may give depending on the situation. So all vaccines can be given in this uh, above compartment. Uh, in the lower compartment, no live vaccines. and Try to defer the inactivated if possible. Uh, I will not get into cocooning. That is a little complex and not needed. So these are just some of the principles. Uh, basically the same thing I have been speaking. Ah, so again, this is just <laughs> some time pass. So timing, loha garam hai, maar do hatoga. So, in a sort of solid, solid organ transplant recipient patient, patient of CKD, uh, so he will go through these stages. When he has early CKD, then he has ESRD, then if you're going for transplant, then uh, immediate post-transplant, intermediate and late post-transplant, and then 24, hours, 24 months after the transplant. So, early in uh, the disease, he is having mild to moderate only. Only when he gets to, gets to ESRD, needing HD and all, that's when he gets into severe. So this is, uh, you know, uh, these patients, we have a long window of time to vaccinate them. And we should use it. So what do we use in the adult with comorbidities uh, or a normal adult uh, when the immune status is intact? So influenza annually for all adults, pneumococcal conjugate, the pneumococcal polysaccharide uh, and hepatitis B. This is for all patients with comorbidities, practically. Diabetes, heart disease, liver disease, kidney disease, COPD. This is for all patients who have a mild to moderate immune suppress, so suppression. Um, the other ones below four, that means five, six, seven, eight, and nine, these are in some select situations. Uh, so, meningococcal is when you are traveling to uh, abroad and going to stay in dormitories and all that. Uh, 
and same for meningococcal B vaccine and hepatitis A if you are having specifically CLD or some other liver problem. So above four hours for nearly all adults with comorbidities. So this is what I mean when practically every other patient who comes to general medicine OPD will have diabetes or CKD or CLD or COPD. So unko ye char milna hi milta hai. Agar nahi mila hai to. Then um, traveling abroad, traveling to dormitories, meningococcal and CLD patients, especially hepatitis A is additional. Then your CKD patients, CLD patients, COPD patients who are antibody negative for MMR and varicella, they also deserve this, especially if they are going to go for transplant later on. Then in severe immunosuppression, no, uh, no live vaccines, defer the inactivated ones, a cocoon strategy and let it go. Then, so when you are faced with a patient, try to determine which stage he is falling into. If you are confused, you can take the help of specialists uh, and uh, based on that, we can decide the vaccination plan. So now in autoimmune diseases, they can be very labile. Their immune status can be very labile. So if patient is not on treatment and immune status is not so bad, after the treatment starts, everything changes. So it's a little difficult to manage. So she is planned. So this patient is planned for cyclophosphamide. Um, but right now is not on cyclophosphamide. So right now immunity is okay. Uh, but would you give live vaccines if they are needed? And the problem is that uh, you need at least 14 days, 21 days for a good immunity to develop. And you don't want to give a live vaccine just uh, before you give cyclophosphamide. You may actually then cause a severe vaccine-induced diseases. So this actually happened in one of the liver transplant patients I read in some case report. So his primary physician gave him varicella vaccine because he was antibody negative and he was bound for transplant. The problem was the transplant was next week. So at the time of transplant, the person received heavy immune supply, induction immune therapy for the liver transplant. And just one week prior, he had received a live vaccine. So this is a problem. So don't just determine the immune status right now. Try to make a guess what is the immune status going to be for the next two, three weeks because your vaccine will need that much time to uh, get the uh, work done. Then, uh, so these are just some small tables. So the standard guidelines in the books. So what should be the ideal time gap between... Uh, so if you are going to give heavy immune suppression to somebody, you need to vaccinate with inactivated vaccines. What should be the time back uh, time gap? And if you're trying to give live vaccine, then what should be the time gap? So this I've ordered in this way that the earlier drugs, the ones on the top are actually less immunosuppressive. As you come down, they are more and more immunosuppressive. So the duration keeps increasing. So at CQS and sulfasalazine, there is no delay needed. You can just go ahead, right? So this... In this patient, this was the thing. So four weeks we needed before a cyclophosphamide and we wanted to give. So talk to the rheumatologist, ask him, can we delay the cyclo by a few weeks? If possible, then go ahead. Otherwise, wait. Uh, suppose you have given cyclophosphamide and now you want to vaccinate. So how long should you wait? So again, that is also given in the guidelines. For live vaccines, you wait three months. For inactivated, you can wait four weeks. So this was a patient pemphigus on rituximab. Last dose was one week ago. Now she has come for vaccination. When can you give her live? And uh, so similar kind of tables are there. In bone marrow, uh, small subtle differences are there. In a bone marrow recipient, he is considered immunologically naive. And the first three months post bone marrow, the patient is having actually zero immune. So, and then three to 12 months, the gradual immune restoration happens. Inactivated can be started from the third month onwards. And no live vaccine still two years after bone marrow. Even after two years, no live vaccines. If there is GVHD and patient is on something for that. Um, this is the schedule for post bone marrow transplant. Uh, so cocoon basically what it means is that 
vaccinate the household members who are going to give care to the patient and uh, suppose the caregiver is going to be somebody who is not from the family still do kakuni because in the period of severe immune suppression even if you vaccinated the patient if the caregiver is having some disease then he will give it so you vaccinate the immediate people who are going to be with the patient around the patient for that period of immune suppression and prior to the period so like suppose somebody is planned for a bone marrow so one two months prior to the bone marrow vaccinate the with appropriate vaccination all the caregivers of that patient so the first three months after transplant unko bhi kisi ko kuch nahi hona so that is actually called as kakuni then uh, thank you that thank you yeah yeah i think we have made everyone sleep after exciting oh, tv presentations boring vaccine presentations we ask questions we ask questions of course of course so two questions for the test people and one question for the ah huh. what is the current flow What is the current role of doing one two test? If you say that uh, in a contact case, all these things will be possible. So uh, basically, current role of doing one <clears throat> one two test is to detect the latent infection. Okay. Now there has been a lot of thirst on uh, treating for latent infection. So suppose you have a household contact uh, of TB or any health worker. And you do mantus test, and if that's positive, then you may decide whether you want to treat this patient for latent infection or no. Second role is that sometime when uh, you don't uh, have any other thing positive, suppose a patient is presenting with a with an X-ray picture or radiological picture, and you are not able to decide whether it is TB or anything else. The closest differential is sarcoidosis. So in that case, you would want to do a mantus test. and here the negative mantu will be more important so that that will you know go more in favor of sarcoidosis so these are the and many times when patient is going abroad or somebody is going abroad a normal person where ruling out latent tuberculosis is important so in that scenario we do a mantu test or tb gold test second question is can we get the body closer to the rate of the virus so that was and that was an article that they survive for life yes absolutely so they they survive for life they remain in the dormant oh, state and that is that is why to be tb epidemic or endemicity is there for millennia together they can survive and they can so only way to take care is by having a stronger immunity but you cannot eradicate unless they start multiplying because most of these drug do not work on the dormant passive most i mean none of the drug work on the dormant
So basically, the, the story is that patient had for 12 years back a pointer key, and that is the time he was diagnosed with HIV. So the HIV test is take some medicine against the retrovirus he prescribed. And he also said he continued his different protocols for that. Because he was a he was a very good eyes. Very good eyes. So it can be started. So every time he was going to this specialist, he said he continued the same thing with the retrovirus against the So he was continuing till that time. The HIV medicine and along with that, it's a little bit of And he had no side effects. He is absolutely open. No. I wanted to ask one. The presentation said that group cut biopsy always almost is equivalent to the whole lymph node biopsy. Is there are there any special situations where you require a full lymph node biopsy? Yes. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Because yeah. No, what has happened is group cut is what everyone is doing. Yeah. Even when this has happened in one of my patients where it, Specifically, row for full lymph node biopsy. Of course, if patients that want to data, they are not going to follow. Sometimes, what happens is that they should not be informed. Then, you may end up hitting the necrotic area and you may miss the diagnosis. So, in that case, having a complete disease is important. Second is when you are doing a two cut uh, biopsy and sending it for culture. Is always a lesser material compared to when you are subjecting the entire tissue for culture. That is, the tissue and, yeah, and for diagnosis of lymphoma, I think it would be important to have it. The entire six months, the load is very small. Yeah. So, uh, it will be not better. Exactly. That's what I think. It's a very simple uh, procedure. It's a game to see the patient who has the anesthesia. The and the percent of the get this. It comes to the 10% of the age group and This was followed. That depends on the lucky. If has already undergone a group cut and nothing has come, then he has come to you as a second opinion. Then you can tell him, okay, now we'll do excision. If you have asked for an excision, if you have asked for a group cut, you have to ask for an much more difficult to get this kind of patient. With you only, your own option is taking the body. Also, patient is also a patient. Yes, patient is also a patient. Data of, of the data of the vaccine, the data vaccine, because the newer recommendations 
healthcare workers, the OPDs. So these come from international guidelines. Okay. Yeah. So, but there are OPDs. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Thank you. 